Yeah, hello everybody. Thank you very much for joining me today where we're going to uh, look at lesson number eight. And uh, in lesson eight, we're going to be going through, well, we'll go through the lesson itself, but we're primarily looking at our um, local plant survey. And then we're going to look at that plant system design, which is um, quite exciting because now we're really diving into some design portions of the course rather than really focusing on, um, well, primarily focusing early on site analysis and sort of getting our bearings in terms of uh, the different steps to take during the de design process. So what I think I'll do is share my screen here and we'll just take a look at uh, this lesson. All right. All righty. <clears throat> Just have a sip of tea here. And I've got <clears throat> uh, some examples that I can show you um, from other students as well as uh, some of our work, which is going to relate to the plant system design. And um, Honestly, that is what first pulled me into the landscape industry. It was all about plants and, um, and how they interact together. And in my early years, it was really a focus on the aesthetic end of it, um, which luckily <laughs> I had some really good mentors and uh, I was uh, pushed in the right direction where where the um, ecological systems were also really important in particular soils. So let's take a look at lesson eight and uh, it's in two parts, as you can see. I'll get my little pointer going here. Uh, just a reminder, if, if when we're going through today's uh, Q and A, if you do have any questions don't hesitate to pop them in the document here, and I will pop that into the chat. As soon as I find it, there we go. All right. So let's go back to lesson eight. All right. So the, uh, as I'm sure you've noticed with several of the assignments, there's usually, uh, you know, a really, a real focus and there's part of the assignment that's important, but not quite as important in terms of grades. So you can see here, your local plant survey is four points and then the plant system design is 14. So it gives you a little bit of an idea of, you know, how to allocate, ideally, how to allocate um, your time and energy. And the local plant survey is, I think, pretty straightforward. Um, we are looking at five native or naturalized plants that are medicinal uh, in your area and what they're used for and what part of the plant is used. So it's a really I think a great exercise to go through and there's some really good resources I can point you towards. Um, they're probably in the resource section anyways, but it is quite amazing how much medicine is around us uh, just in our native plants, let alone any introduction in anything that's introduced into your, uh, into your landscape. So again, we want to look at some of those plants, what their medicinal uses, um, some of the wild food that people have historically eaten during each season. And then we're getting more into, you know, where you can obtain those, uh, through nurseries in your area, as well as taking a look at some of the farms that are in your area that you're comfortable uh, shopping at. So it, it's pretty straightforward. We want, uh, again, to use scientific names or botanical names, um, 
you want to really cross check some of this information to make sure that it's accurate. So if you were to read somewhere, oh, <clears throat> let's say uh, stinging nettle is uh, is a medicinal and it's used for for X, Y, or Z, you would certainly want to verify that with some other sources just to make sure um, that you're not going to ingest something that's uh, not good for you. Yeah, and then um, a little bit of annotation here. So let's take a look at an example. We'll go to a back up a little bit here. One of our past students. And this person lives uh, or lives on um, not too far from where I am, but a couple hours away. And you can see here, uh, there's a list of four plants. Um, way back in the day, I think we only asked for three. So in this case, we're asking for five, but you can see there's, uh, there's yarrow or Achillea millifolium. There's horsetail, which I'm sure um, you know, as valuable as it is, you don't really want to see that in your landscape. Uh, blue elderberry and Oregon grape, and there's many, many more. Um, some that can be quite surprising. So I really enjoy this part of the assignment as far as uh, from a grading perspective, because I continually learn a lot about all of these plants and uh, I'm fascinated with these two columns here where we get into the actual properties that are used and why they're being used, what what the uses of these are. So that's a little bit of a snapshot of that. Now, if you're looking for a really good source, Plants for the Future is just fantastic. I really enjoy uh, um, going on this site here. And all you do, you know, it's, it's a pretty simple web address. P. Oh, sorry about that. I'll just turn down my phone. PFAF.org, or you can just Google it. And all you do is you put your search up here. So let's take a, a native plant just as an example, let's say Douglas fir, and you wouldn't think Douglas fir has a whole lot of medicinal uses, but it has this is an excellent database. So what we get is uh, there should be an image up here. I'm not sure why my video is running slow, maybe too much going on on our network right now. Um, but we get a breakdown here of your common name, the family, the hardiness zone. So these are all, you know, interesting, uh, the habitat. And this is where it gets very interesting. We get into edibility rating and we get into other uses and medicinal rating. So who would know that Douglas fir has got a two out of five uh, edibility and a two out of five on the medicinal rating. That, that's very interesting. So we get a little bit more information as we go down here, just a, a rough description, as well as edible uses uh, and medicinal uses. And uh, it's fascinating to go through these, especially with our native plant material. Um, so this is a, a one really good resource. And uh, I know in if we go back here to the assignment resource tab, uh, that's listed here, along with many others. Uh, that This I find particularly good in terms of um, covering both bases, uh, medicinal and edible uh, potential on plants. And uh, I often find even with some ornamental that, you know, there are, there are plants that I've been working with for years that uh, are indeed, you know, uh, valued in terms of either medicinal or edible um, properties. So great, great resource. Uh, another really good resource is the Natural Capital Plant Database. That's a great one as well. So that gives you a little heads up about resources and what's expected there. 
Uh, and then, of course, please do take a look at um, what's required uh, with the rubric here, because uh, with as with all assignments, this is how I grade you, and uh, you'd want to ensure that you're including all these elements within your assignments. So that is about it with the local plan survey. Does anybody have any questions about that part of the assignment? If they want to chime in, can now, can wait till later, whatever whatever works. Um, I do think it's pretty straightforward. Now for the more uh, challenging part of the assignment is the plant system design. And this is uh, a really fun part because this is where we start to get to play with plants. Now, the tricky part of this is we're, we're going through this process, but we're doing it on paper. And I'm the first to admit that in my, the earlier part of my career, I would have really struggled uh, with this because I needed to be on site with the plants and design it kind of on the fly. And I, I operated that way for, oh gosh, at least a decade um, before shifting into more um, solid documentation of design. So if you're having trouble with this, you know, do keep in the back of your mind that, you know, it will get easier and um, everybody's got to start somewhere. Um, if you had seen my first plantings, uh, <laughs> they're, they're, um, they weren't great. So luckily I had some really good uh, mentors when I was an apprentice and very, very uh, understanding and let me experiment. And uh, that's the best way to learn, of course. So this is a wonderful way to do it without committing to putting anything in the ground. Um, if we look at the requirements here, basically what we're taking is we're not looking at a full planting plan of your project site right now right? What we want to do is take a little section of that, and you can choose wherever that is. And we want to do a few things here. So, so first of all, we want to come up with a goal. So what is the goal of that? And as shown above here, it could be a hedgerow, it could be a windbreak, it could be uh, you know, intensive plantings, it could be a, it could be a pollinator garden, it could be, there could be all sorts of uh, reasons that you're doing this, what you're hoping to achieve, the focus, uh, what kind of production, and is that just to look beautiful, or is it to look beautiful and provide medicine, uh, or food, or both, um, and what, this is a good part too, you know, what kind of level of management <clears throat> would you be looking at? So you'll probably find that uh, plant systems within your zone one are going to be those that require the highest level of um, management. You're, you're going to naturally want to keep those at a high level because you, you know, you're going to be seeing them on a daily basis. And with that, we want to choose at least two individual plants of similar structure. So a ca the caveat is here, you may want to choose two existing plants that you have, or you might want to consider two plants that you're going to be introducing, but they do want to have some similar structure. So uh, maybe they're two trees, maybe they're two fruit trees, maybe they're uh, nut trees. Um, what I think is nice in terms of this exercise is if you can achieve uh, a plant design that's looking at all those various layers. So when I say layers, I mean, you know, from that tree canopy right down to the ground cover. So keep that in the back of your mind. That is some um, a really healthy exercise uh, to go through. 
uh, as I'm sure many of you have seen, especially in commercial landscapes, uh, when you go and look at them, they're often, uh, uh, you know, one layer is quite dominant. It may be a planting of just trees with nothing underneath them. It may be a whole bunch of shrubs kind of mushed together with nothing below or above. And with the plant system design here, we're really trying to point everybody in a direction uh, where, you know, basically all of these layers need each other to do well and to, to be optimally, not on, only optimally um, growing and thriving, but just from an aesthetic point of view and an ecological point of view. If you look at, um, for instance, if I just turn and look out my window, I can see, the edge of our forest that's on our property. And when you look at the edge of the forest, you can see those various layers we have. For, for us, we have a tall Douglas fir canopy, then it comes down to um, a large shrub canopy. And we also have some smaller trees that are growing in that zone. Uh, and then we get into that herbaceous canopy and very low shrub. And then potentially in that ground cover, uh, climber, and even, um, you know, more tuber uh, type plants. So really, I can't emphasize enough is just think of those different layers. And there's no right or wrong with this. You're, you're not uh, going to be graded on whether I think your, your design is going to work or not. You know, that's very subjective. Um, this is more about trying to include all of those things. So here are important things to consider. So the ecological service that's provided and right away, if you have tree shrub perennial there, and I've seen this on projects where we have, um, started creating a landscape. And as soon as we get that tree and shrub layer in. Uh, in fact, on, on a large project we did, there was very little activity, um, bird, insect activity. Soon as we got those foundational plants in, boom, the birds moved in. So they need to have those different layers to feel safe. Um, and as well as that herbaceous layer provides a good food source and cover for them. So think about that. So that's an ecological function. Um, what yield are you hoping for? And why have you placed plants in that chosen position? That's, that's worth considering. You know, it may be because, well, this is a, a plant that needs a lot of light in a nice little microclimate. Maybe you're planting, let's say, an, an olive that where I live, uh, it's really on the edge of, of hardiness and whether we can get away with that but maybe it's near a south wall. So that would be an example why that would be going there. It's suited for that uh, microclimate. And have you ensured adequate space? So, uh, and it's not only adequate space for management, it's adequate space for the plants themselves. And I would, uh, I would encourage you to consider when you're placing your trees and shrubs to do it in a manner where you're giving them the space they need over the duration of you know, their life, or at least that the 10 to 20 year span. I mean, it's really hard to predict exact sizes that uh, your plants are gonna be, become, but you can, you can get pretty close. And with experience, you get better and better at this. But ideally you wanna place those so you do not have to do any um, serious pruning. Um, unless that is your intent from the beginning. I'm just taking a, a coppice agroforestry course. So, and that's of course all about hard pruning of woody material. Um, so that is a biggie. That's one thing I see um, people do where they, they over plant the woody elements. And then it's really difficult down the road to correct that without renovating the whole landscape again. Uh, what you can do is you can use perennials as fillers and those can be shifted over time quite easily. So effective space 
uh, or adequate space is a really good consideration. You want that the size of each plant when it's fully grown. So even if you're buying a one gallon, you know, a very small, say it was a chestnut, you want to show that chestnut as it's going to get larger. And typically we'll, we may not show it at full growth, but we will show it sort of in that midpoint. Um, so you do want to do a little bit of research. And uh, honestly, you can't overdo that end because plant knowledge is such a key part of the design process. Um, but that comes with time. So, but getting used to learning more and more about plants is just a, a really good use of time. You also want to consider with your trees that you're going to have a drip line and how that's going to interact with plants that are below it. So we'll, I'll show you a few examples. We get into that a little bit deeper. Um, there's an idea here of designing by subtraction. So thinking about the space you need to manage those primary species. So <clears throat> this, this can be quite, um, varied. So if you're planting trees that are harvest, that you're harvesting fruit from, you absolutely need to consider your access to, to harvest and pruning. If it's, if there's any trees in there that are more on the ornamental side or more for their aesthetic beauty, then that is less um, important. And in fact, you know, much of the ornamental work we have done, uh, pruning, tree pruning is just, you know, if you've done the initial design and installation correctly, it's pretty minimal. It's just dead and diseased wood that you'd be taking out. So that's a consideration. Um, considering your sectors, and your microclimates are, are pretty vital. So if you go back to your sector map and you look at it and you think, ah, I've got wind coming from a winter wind coming from a certain direction that I do want to screen, then <clears throat> your plant choices are gonna fall into that. This is your opportunity to put the right plant, plant in place to do that, as well as the microclimate. And let's see. So then we get into how to arrange all this. And there are so many ways you can do this. Um, and you'll constantly probably <laughs> change your thoughts on that. Uh, I'll, I'll show you a few examples uh, after I've gone through this of what we've done. And you'll see there's just you know, uh, endless possibilities. So you may, you may want to have your landscape uh, uh, such where it has unity, right? So it has a feeling of unity. And to do that, you need to have some repetition. So that means you need to select a plant and repeat it through the landscape. Uh, and, and often that could be a woody plant, it could be a tree, it could be a shrubs, it also may be grasses or herbaceous plants or anything like that. So unity is a biggie that you would want to consider. It's, and this only really dials into the aesthetic end of it. If the aesthetics are just not on the radar and not important, then, you know, you don't need to concern yourself with that as much. But what you may find, and I probably could find a, a photo. I had one client who almost wanted one of every plant that she could possibly get in her landscape. And uh, as beautiful as it was, it was very, well, we'll say it was, it had a feeling of being very busy. There was a lot going on for the eye. And if, you know, you take, nature as our inspiration and you look at uh, a meadow or a forest or any natural habitat um, 
you don't typically find the same mass diversity uh, when you're looking at it. So there's a calming effect. There's a calming effect when you look at a Douglas fir forest. So even though there may be cedar and pine and uh, big leaf maple and other items in there. So unity is, is something that um, you might want to keep in the back of your mind. So clumping uh, is one consideration. We often do that with uh, herbaceous plants. We will drift or clump many individuals together. Uh, curve, or linear, curve linear rows. So trying to create, rather than being very linear with your plantings, you may want to give it a more naturalistic feel. Uh, layering by height, we've discussed that. Uh, solar bowl, so you may have uh, really a microclimate on your site that is just this fantastic uh, bowl of heat. And on our property where I live, we have several of those that we've identified. So we know when we want that late, let's say we want uh, really good solar exposure for uh, a certain plant during the, the fall when it's you know coming into its glory, we know where we can uh, find that. So and again, that goes back to our, our site analysis, knowing where those places are and how do the plants support each other. And that is such a huge part of these multi-layered plantings. And honestly, I think uh, the guilds are, are fascinating systems. And really this, this design, plant system design has a focus on that. But I also think that with all of the plantings I've done in my time, um, the layering of material, provided they all enjoy the same microclimate or habitat, um, they support each other in a really good way. Unless you're looking at specific plants, uh, let's see, what would that be? Like a Western red cedar. We'll use that as an example. They're extremely hard to work around because they have a fibrous surface root. They're used to being in areas that are quite damp. So if you're trying to, to plant a guild around cedars, wow, that is super hard to do. Even a cedar hedge is going to have a tremendous impact on the plantings uh, around it. So that's something to to keep in the back of your head, but that doesn't happen that often. That is quite rare when you have a conflict. It's really a conflict of root systems and water requirements. Um, and that's a whole other uh, thing that I don't know if we mentioned here in the consideration, but, but it's not only sun, but water requirements. So if we put um, a moisture lover next to a plant that enjoys a zero scape, or a dry setting, you're probably going to have a mixed result. You're even either one is going to do really well and the other isn't, or they they may both not. <laughs> so that's something to to keep in the back of your mind when you're researching the plants as well. And that's kind of something that you'll develop over time. Uh, and then be sure to label them with. Uh, botanical names or scientific names uh, in addition to the common names. Okay. And then there's some elements here that we want to include. So we want to see the existing conditions. So we want to see your base plan. What's the area look like before you're going to apply any design elements to that? And then the proposed plan. Uh, and again, that's just going to be this this given section of your landscape, not the whole thing, that's coming. Um, and then we want to do a little cross section view of that. And it's not, doesn't have to be very large as we'll see in some of the uh, uh, examples here. And then there's a plant species matrix where we're listing all the plants and some of those attributes and their interrelationship uh, and management questions here that we want to look at. And of course, the SWOT analysis. So after you've gone through this, 
you know, what, what is your takeaway? What have you sort of seen that are strengths and uh, weaknesses in that, uh, in that design? So let's take a quick peek here at um, a couple of examples. So if we look at this person's plant system design, <clears throat> this has been set up, I think, quite nicely in that we have in the bottom here, uh, the base plan. And then we have a highlighted area of their plant system design. So I, I like that. That's a really nice way of showing the whole and how it relates to it. And then here is the basically their base plan, uh, the entrance to the property, what's currently existing. And this is where it's quite nice to have your existing plants uh, grayed out. And you'll see why that's a value when we get to the actual design here. Uh, so this is the area, but this is where uh, the student is going to provide the proposed fig guild. So um, as you can see, it's not very big, right? This is only about 30 feet wide. So, and that's totally fine to do that. So don't feel, you know, occasionally we'll get, um, a student will, will basically design their whole landscape for this exercise. And you eventually are going to do that, but you don't have to do it, uh, in this step here. So we have our statement of purpose and two goals and the, whoops, the strategies and elements that are applied here. And that's great information uh, to consider uh, as well as our title block and North Arrow and all of that. Uh, so then the next page, we're gonna look at the design itself. And as you can see, um, this person has a legend and they're using uh, letters really as a key to the plants that are here. Uh, as you'll see, when, when I do a design, I actually label each individual or not each individual, but uh, the groups. And that would be hard for you to do in this course, um, given these symbols you know, it's hard to differentiate the symbols, whereas the software I use have individual um, symbols. So we'll, and we'll look at that. So using a legend is a, a good idea because we do definitely want to identify these. Uh, there's some pictures here of some of the, the main players, uh, which is really helpful. Uh, and let's see here, there's a little bit of, uh, detail and that's a great thing to think about because often we'll be designing and of course on a 2d overhead view, everything is flat. And when we get to the site and we start working, we have to consider some of these details. So this, uh, person here has described how they're going to, uh, plant with that slope in mind. And then a little, a few notes here on that Mediterranean fig guild. So one thing to consider uh, with this, this person says that they intend to be unirrigated, but the reality is in the beginning, you know, and this could be up to three years, um, your plants may need to be supplemented, right? You may need to supplement that irrigation to keep them healthy and strong. And the, probably the biggest setback a plant can have is that first year where it doesn't uh, get the water needs that it requires. So keep that in your mind in terms, you know, going forward. Um, thick compost and silverberry and rock habits for snakes. And that is, I love that. We do that um, in our garden. We have what we call uh, little uh, sort of uh, snake uh, condos where we pile small rocks up that we take out of beds and uh, they indeed love them. So 
it's a great habitat for them to warm up in. So that was our actual plant system design. As you can see, it doesn't have to be large. Uh, and then we get to the cross section and you can see how valuable that is in this situation where we have a little bit of slope going on. So this is a really nice section drawing. It has a scale. Um, it has the plants clearly shown in their mature height. And it's even showing some root activity below ground. I mean, you certainly don't have to go to those extremes. Uh, and it shows the slope. Uh, this is existing grade and how that slope might be uh, flattened a little bit. Um, I would say in this case, you probably don't have to, you don't have to have your bed flat, but it's, there's no doubt that uh, the less slope it has, um, water will tend to infiltrate a little bit better. And then there's a little bit about water in here, micro irrigation on a timer. Uh, that's a really good option to have. Um, we find with some of our new plantings, even with imported topsoil and, you know, the highest quality compost we can get, we're having to irrigate up to three times a week during the heat of the summer in that first year. So you do have to be mindful. That's really hard to do manually or for even a client to, to pull off and do. So you might want to keep that in the back of your, um, just one other thing to consider. So yeah, this is a, a nice section view. And then we go to that plant matrix. That's pretty straightforward. And you can see this is, you know, got a lot of information in it. And uh, even just going through this and assembling this, even though it is a bit time consuming, it's going to provide you with quite a bit of information on each individual plant and whether they're you know, well suited. And, and this is where we get into um, some of those potential conflicts. So we have two kind of what's labeled here as uh, sub canopy, which are basically shrubs. And we have one that needs high levels of light and it's fine to be dry. And we have another plant here that can tolerate full shade and needs to have a certain level of moisture. So you know, that, um, that's completely possible in the same planting. We just have to be really mindful of where that's actually being positioned. And then we go to the SWOT analysis. So you can see the student uh, has a few takeaways. They're starting with poor soil and they know they can sort of shift um, the poor soil is going to lean into that Mediterranean climate because it's uh, being as dry as it is, it tends to have a little less fertility. So the plants that are within this, um, like lavender, oregano, sage, all of these do quite well with lower levels of fertility. In fact, they can have the opposite effect if they get too much. So that is student example. And there's no questions here. Okay, let, um, I'm just going to stop share and go to another screen here. And I will just show you an example of what we have done. I'll make this a little bit bigger. And bear in mind, this is quite different than what we're asking you to do. This is a deliverable to uh, one of our clients. And it is a full planting plan of the entire landscape. And if I back up here a bit, <clears throat> you can see in this case, what we do, and I'm this is more appropriate for a larger planting like this rather than what you're going to be doing. But we separate out uh, our design viewports 
into uh, tree and shrub uh, and then herbaceous and below here we're showing an overall okay so if we go to that overall i'm just going to zoom in a bit if we go here uh, I'll, I'll refer back to this other sheet where these are indeed labeled, but you can see these are different symbols and these are all basically different trees that our client wanted. And we have tried to unify it with some of these shrubs that are the same. Uh, along the fence line here is a group that's similar. So we've kind of grouped some of these together. Now, this particular client wanted quite a diverse planting. So we've tried to strike a balance between that and this is a edible landscape. Um, let's take a look at, so here's the woody elements here, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, we've got, this is typically what we do, but you can see this could be quite difficult with what we're asking you know, in this course, but perhaps down the road, if you're doing this on a professional level, you know, you may want to consider this. So basically we have a call out on this plant um, and we have our total units. So in this design, we have one. Uh, Prunus Halls Hardy, so that's a Halls Hardy Almond, a beautiful hardy almond that does well in this environment. And in our drawings, we will put the pot size that we recommend. Um, and that uh, really helps when we're going to price the installation because we do both design and installations. So you can see here, we've got a number, here's a couple of ornamentals. So we've got these winter flowering viburnums and these late spring evergreen choicias that are just, you know, they are beautiful, but they're, and that's what they're providing, that aesthetic. But we're also trying to get uh, quite a, a bit of edible content in here. So aronia and mulberry and some blueberries. Uh, again, the client absolutely had to have a Japanese maple, so they got that, uh, and a cornice mass, which is a wonderful um, dogwood, oh, beautiful fruit, almost uh, when they're fully ripe, they're very, very similar to plums. And let me just zip over. And then what we do is we separate the perennials because if I was trying to put all these labels on one sheet because there's so much variety, it would be very, very hard. Uh, the other thing I like about doing this is I can see the proportion of woody plants to herbaceous. And we know with the woody plants, that's gonna provide our structure uh, during the growing season and during the winter. And then here we're looking at our herbaceous. And this is where we start to bulk up numbers. So as you can see, we've got uh, Stachys of Finis and we've got 10 of those. And they're just drifted through the landscape. So all of these white symbols here are that plant. Uh, the same with asparagus. So all of these are asparagus. So we've drifted those. And then you'll see something like the uh, artichoke we have grouped. So we do a little bit of both where we'll drift an element through the landscape and we'll also group it for kind of a bold impact because um, artichoke, for instance, have a really bold foliage not only a beautiful flower and uh, quite yummy to eat, but um, so in this case, we have a group of three here, we have a group of three here, and we have one here, but one group is labeled and we know there's seven, so we know to look elsewhere for the others and so on and so forth. So 
a few things we do that um, might conflict a little bit uh, with some of the things you've seen. So for instance, these, these trees that we have proposed, we like to underplant them. And in this case, we have underplanted a lot with comfrey, the, the clumping Russian comfrey, which is, uh, of course, an amazing plant all on its own from a medicinal standpoint, as well as um, a biomass producer. You know, a lot of people will chop and drop this, and that's a great uh, approach. I tend not to do that because, uh, oh, I see somebody's got a question in the chat here. I'll answer in two seconds. Um, I don't tend to chop and drop our um, comfrey just because they are such a bee magnet. And um, uh, I have a hard time doing that when they're in flower. They always seem to perpetually be kicking them out. So, we have a couple of questions here from Melissa. Uh, is there enough evergreen shrubs to support aesthetics? That is really subjective, okay? And that depends on your client. And if we go back to that sector analysis, what they're trying to achieve. Uh, in this landscape, it's fully fenced. So it has a six or six and a half foot fence going all the way around. So there's not a concern to screen out uh, a neighbor, at least during the whole year. And often, yeah, I, I hear what you're saying. We like to hit a balance with that. And I'll show you uh, a couple of photos here, as long as I don't run out of time. I'll get my photos up and going. Um, but that is a very good question. And I would say that is a little bit different with every single project we do. And an example, which I'll show you uh, some images of, um, would be a project that we did last year. And there's this huge, it's an urban project, kind of like uh, this one here but it's surrounded by Douglas fir forest. So we already have this tremendous evergreen content. Uh, so it's less important in the landscape, uh, at least in the rear garden of this particular client. So if it's a wide open space, yeah, you're gonna wanna integrate more of that. But again, that's very, very personal. And then we start getting into the aesthetic end of it and what you find appealing. Uh, another question here, are there enough? Oh, sorry. Do, do, do. So I think you covered that in the same. Try not to mix ornamentals and edibles. Yeah, you got it. So <clears throat> I think this will become a little more clear when I show you uh, one of our projects here. I'm just going to get that lined up before I switch screens. But that is an incredibly important thing in my opinion, is that you do not want to have bare ground. Uh, now the reason for that, and this can actually cause some people to get uncomfortable. And I don't mean students, I mean um, clientele. Um, not many of our clients, it's only happened, I think once, where some people see it as kind of out of control growth. And <clears throat> that's, that's true. Uh, we don't wanna control it too much. Okay, I got it here. Let me stop share and I'm just gonna switch, switch to some photos here. So here's an example. Here's an example of a landscape actually it doesn't have a lot of evergreen content in it. And it's on a hundred acre, hundred plus acre organic farm. Uh, some fields in the background. Um, the primary purpose here was to try and create 
a landscape that was in keeping with this sort of wild surrounding areas. And you can see here, if we go through, you can see the repetition. So there's a lot of different plant materials in here, but we have uh, some similar trees. We have huge drifts of ornamental grasses. We have some grasses here. It was really heavy on the grasses so that it would blend in well with surrounding areas. Uh, you can see these Lysimachia ephemeron, one of my favorite perennials from my ornamental days. Uh, you can see them here, here, here. So those get repeated. Uh, and then we repeat, we've clustered this Flomus here, Flomus rosaliana. We've got some over here. Uh, we've also got some Echinops, Rytro, that's being repeated. And then there'll be sort of some one ofs. So in this view, we have a one of with the aster. We've also got some penstemon over here. Um, some liatris, there's, there's all kinds of things. There's a verbascum here. So we're into medicinal now. And, um, but you'll notice uh, you can't see the ground. And um, this is a year after planting. Now, because we're not seeing the ground, we have a whole lot less opportunity for incoming weeds, okay? So the maintenance of this automatically goes down in terms of weeding and then in terms of water requirement because we're getting less evaporation there's less soil uh, being exposed to direct sun and some people would in this case because this is an ornamental landscape uh, you know some people would say well i have no room to get into the beds and that's true there is actually no reason to get into the bed during the growing season in this situation, right? So if these were edibles and we wanted to get in here to, to harvest, we would have to consider that. And it doesn't mean you'd have to have bare soil. It's just what types of plants that you would select, right? So you'd want some lower items around those pathways. So you still got coverage on the ground. Uh, but you had some easy access for harvest. And let me try and find one other one here when we we're talking about evergreen versus not. Okay, there's just one for one of I'll show you. It's a landscape we did many, 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 many years. This is the landscape I was talking about that the owner wanted just this huge variety. And you can see we, we ended up repeating um, some ear mirrors, these foxtail lilies, which are quite lovely. But for the most part, this there, there's one of with the trees and with the shrub elements. So you can see that it has a completely different effect uh, aesthetically, right? Especially when we get to the edge. So that's, uh, that's just a, an example of repetition and unity versus maybe not having quite as much. I'm just trying to find one more batch of photos here, sorry. Uh -huh. All right. Uh, let's see here. This is a big landscape we did in Nanaimo here. These were all, it's all wooden retaining walls that got, um, they were all kind of, they were full of carpenter ants. <laughs> they were uh, on their way out. So 
we replaced that. Uh, we had to demo it, demo all the concrete, and then a bunch of uh, retaining went in and some concrete unit pavers, which set the, let me see. Just trying to find an appropriate picture here to demonstrate what I was talking about. Yes, now here's a great example. <clears throat> this is what happens when you get drainage wrong. And uh, it's, it's uh, good to take note of because things do go sideways and occasionally. So in this case, this wall got installed during the fall and we had, we worked together with an excavation contractor to do the demo and all the prep work. And then we had a, a mason that we've worked with for 20 years come in and do the, all the hardscape. And he had a crew with him. <clears throat> and believe it or not, I think it was like December 23rd. We we're on our Christmas break. We get a call, help. We got water everywhere. Uh, and uh, <laughs> after spending quite a bit of money just to get to this first phase of work, so we arrived and uh, pretty horrified to see this. Um, so what ended up happening is one of the people that were working with the, our contractor um, with any retaining system, the drainage behind it is absolutely critical. So we've worked with this fellow for years and years and years, and uh, he's well aware of that, but one of his guys, that uh, was working there uh, went too fast and made a mistake with the actual fall of the drainage pipe. So drainage pipe has to fall in order for water to flow through it. And right in and around this area, <clears throat> um, right in here, uh, the pipe ended up going up. So all of this water got backed up and uh, it, it all got fixed, but, um, it was messy and the, the uh, mason had to tear it apart and redo it, tear the wall apart. And um, he was not happy about that. Um, this is one of, this is right after planting. And this is an example here, uh, I think it was for Melissa. Uh, they have a park basically behind the landscape, all conifers, really tall, secondary growth, <clears throat> you know, you know, it's not old growth, but it's secondary, old secondary. So there's very little evergreen content in here. There's some, there's some at the end here. You can't see too clearly. Um, but in this case, we did not have a lot of, uh, that's another stage of planting when we did the front we did a rain garden out here i'm just trying to i know i have a mature so that's uh less than a year this is like the spring the following spring so we would have planted it <clears throat> this was the year after so you can see these are cardoons they look very close to artichoke um, but we used cardoons in this situation because we want, because where I live, artichoke, unless you protect them, unless you're really mindful over the winter, you're going to lose them. And uh, we didn't want that element to be lost. So we did cardoon, which is still a really interesting plant. But this is a lot of herbaceous, uh, a lot of herbaceous plants and some woodies in here. So it's difficult, that's a new planting. And I might have oh, got another question in the chat. Oh, thank you, Melissa. Uh, yeah, this turned out well, it, it's, I don't have all my photos in this. Hmm. So it's quite a job. Um, but thankfully we've got good people that work with us. We're very hands-on. So we were on the ground with all of this. 
And believe it or not, this is in my garden. So I absolutely love nettle. And I love how it interacts with this ornamental here, this uh, a Brunnera. Um, people are, uh, we use this medicinally and um, yeah, got to have it in our garden. Yeah, that's a rain garden we did. We don't need to get into that today. I can see we're over time here. So sorry to drag you down the path of old projects here, but it's always interesting to see what other people do. I will look for some finished images of that job for our next meeting. Uh, they just don't seem to be on my computer, probably on my phone still, because it did turn out quite nicely. But a big part of that job was, um, oh, here's a couple more. I'm just gonna switch back here. And then we'll see if anybody has any questions and we can wrap her up. So these so are just little bits of the planting. This is, you know, if you were sitting at the patio and uh, this is a really interesting type of rosemary that uh, um, stays very, very pr um, prostrate. Yes, prostrate. I get that mixed up with prostate sometimes. <laughs> um, but it hangs down on and softens the wall really nicely. So any wall we do, especially an Allen block, we years ago we used to just basically do stone walls. Uh, but that that's gotten more and more cost prohibitive. Um, but we want to soften this, right? So that's why these are in here. And this again, a year old. So you can get really quick uh, results. And this is kind of a, and then we have this veggie garden we put in that's enclosed because they get deer and a slightly different planting down at this end. We have some Kinnikinnik and the rosemary, but it's a fun, fun little planting. And the front turned out really well too. All right, so let me stop that for now. Let's take a look at a couple of items in the chat here. So Melissa, do you ever recommend French drains for existing gardens and drainage trouble? Uh, you know, drainage is a really tricky thing to consider. Uh, years ago, <clears throat> if we needed to impose our will in the landscape, we would uh, drain, you know, wouldn't even think about it and get drain drainage installed to dry up an area. And now we do less of that. We try and work with the setting. Um, unless of course you're talking about any structure, right? Like, a like the, um, if you had water putting pressure on a house or any structure, like a, a retaining wall, you absolutely need very, very high quality drainage behind the wall in order to ensure you don't uh, get the result we saw earlier, right? <laughs> um, so do I recommend it? You know, it's so site specific. Uh, I would, if it was a wet area and it wasn't causing any uh, implications to structure, I would try and gear the landscape to work with it now rather than sort of fight against it because you end up having to pump water in later in the, in the year. And, um, you know, that's, that just makes less sense now than it did when I was younger. Um, hope that answers your question, Melissa. Uh, Amanda has a question here. You mentioned earlier that you were an apprentice. I was, how did you find someone to do an apprenticeship with? Well, I was, I was beyond fortunate. I, um, uh, I'll make the long story short. I was working in a greenhouse setting with uh, mentally handicapped uh, people in an institution in British Columbia here in New Westminster. It was called Woodland School. Uh, it's got uh, quite a dark past now, but it was, uh, um, it was a huge facility. And they had two huge, uh, no, one, two, three, 
four huge glass greenhouses. And we would take high level residents and grow hanging baskets that would be sold to the staff. It was a great program. And after working there for a year, I realized I really got dialed into the plants. Um, and <clears throat> we had an unfortunate situation where it was a unionized position and we were on, went on strike. And um, my dad worked at the facility and he would check in on the greenhouse for me and water as needed, but he was as far from a green thumb as you could get. So one night I decided I was going to uh, um, jump the fence and check on the greenhouse, see how things were doing. So I did this and it was a bit of a, an adventure. Um, I just took a look and left. I didn't do anything, but my parents went to a party and they told the story to somebody at the party who happened to, to be in the Vancouver Parks Board running the Macmillan Blodell Conservatory. So <clears throat> the fellow mentioned, hey, you should have your son come and see me. Um, there's an apprenticeship program here. So I got a, a I got a, you know, a helpful introduction to somebody in the system there. And I got an apprenticeship with the Vancouver park system. That was just fantastic. It was, uh, it was a real, um, it was a fantastic experience. I, I got to work in Stanley park quite a bit, uh, Queen Elizabeth park, some of the major parks in the Vancouver area. And, um, so that's how I got my apprenticeship. Now, everybody else that I would meet at school, uh, other than my fellow apprentices in the system, the park system, they all worked with private um, companies. So we used to offer that years ago when we were on um, in a different sort of business format. We were installing like every day. I wouldn't be here doing school if I was back in those days. We had to be on a job site working because we had a high overhead and we had, you know, it was a bit of a crazy life, <clears throat> but we did offer an apprenticeship then. So if you're looking for that, um, you could take, now this is in Canada. So we have a trades system set up for ornamental horticulture or what did they call it? Yeah, I think it was called ornamental horticulture. Not absolutely sure. I'd have to go find my certificate, <laughs> but uh, that was many, many moons ago. And um, I'm not sure if they offer that in the US or not. Uh, or whether it's state specific, that's something definitely to look at. But I think one takeaway, Amanda, is if you want, if, if I was starting over again, and I had the knowledge I have today, I would take a look in your area locally at who is doing work that you, you like, that you would like to be doing, you know, maybe a small company that's designing and installing uh, ecological landscapes, or maybe there are none in your area. Maybe it's going to be an ornamental um, landscape professional, but m perhaps they have really good practices and they don't deal with synthetic fertilizers and herbicides and that sort of thing. And I would go and work, try and get a job and work with them even just for a year and see what their, what their processes are as much as you can, especially if you feel that, and even if you don't at this point, um, if you feel you want to strike out on your own one day and do this. And believe it or not, for a decade, I had absolutely no interest in doing that. Um, I was very, very happy working in a big, beautiful park and getting to play. I, you know, I basically could do anything I wanted each day. If I wanted to go and renovate an area, that's what I'd do. 
but eventually I got to a point where I've, I've just dis discovered I wanted to be on the creative end primarily rather than maintenance. And that's the other thing to consider. Do you want to maintain plants and do a little bit of planting or do you want to primarily build? And maybe that'll take time to, to determine. Um, that's what I would do. So Amanda says, thank you, honestly, circling with online content. So, so you learn better with hands-on. Oh, I get it. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly how I learn. And, um, you know, in the landscape industry, the, the huge learning curve starts when you're, you're planting and observing. So a year later, looking at how things do. Uh, and some of the pictures I showed you are an example of that. So when they get planted, they, the landscapes look like nothing, right? They're small plants. They're, you know, gosh, how's this ever going to turn into anything? Uh, and then boom, you get a good response. And in the early years, you know, there'd be good responses and then some things that didn't do so well. So you kind of figure out um, why that is. You know, you deduce to the best of your ability why that is and shift um, from that point on. I mean, that's sometimes a painful lesson because we, when we install plants, we warranty them for a year. And uh, I wouldn't necessarily recommend that for people starting, but it gives our <clears throat> clients a little bit of reassurance that the investment they're making is, is going to be, you know, we're going to stand behind it. And um, so I definitely, uh, you know, the hands-on experience is, you know, 10 times what this type of education would be. Now, you, I think on the flip side, if you were just to go out and work for somebody without this sort of foundation, it would be a much different experience. So you could probably work for somebody, Amanda, uh, and realize that you have a greater insight that in some areas than they might have because of your experience here, just with increased knowledge with uh, permaculture design and, um, and realizing that everybody's going to apply it a little bit differently. So yeah, I hope that helps you out. Yeah, you're more creative. That's excellent. And uh, definitely would encourage you to do whatever you can to, to exercise that. So and that, that for me, when I was young, that was, I used to work all day, come home, and then I would hit, because this was the day in the days before the internet, uh, hard to imagine. Um, I had a collection of books and I would just dive into learning about plants. I would just, uh, you know, near obsessive, um, just learn more and more and more about plants so that when I went out and I was in a nursery or I was using them, I had this base knowledge of them. And, um, and that continued right through my apprenticeship. And after I finished that, I went and worked in England at Windsor Great Park in England for a year and a half. And uh, that was, a, that was a huge deep dive into plants because they are extremely serious about their landscapes in England, especially the Royal, uh, Royal family over there. I wouldn't be so keen on working for them now, but especially since they only paid me two pounds an hour, which is basically at that time, $5 an hour. Uh, but I wasn't there to make money. I was there to learn and uh, it worked, it worked well. So yeah, I definitely encourage everybody if you have creativity you feel you need to express it even if um that's on a really small scale even a you know a container you know have some fun and learn from it and uh, realize the huge challenge here unlike say an interior designer uh is that these are living entities and the soil is living and there's there's going to be failures um but with that comes, you know, some great information you can take away, but it's extremely variable. So it's really hard to build a landscape and sort of hold it in a, 
it doesn't stay static. Uh, so it's amazing seeing landscapes years later after you've put them in and how they've developed and quite can be quite surprising. So, all right. And uh, well, thank you, Melissa. Yeah, uh, it's always fun to share experience and knowledge with everybody. I have a lot of fun doing this and uh, I've gone way over. So I do apologize for that. Uh, I'm usually a little bit more on the ball when it comes to keeping it to an hour, but it was fun. You know, this part of the course, when we get into the plant system design and the zone one, uh, you know, there's a lot to share and um, I'll do my best on that end. So thank you very much, everybody, for joining me today and uh, best of luck with your assignments. I really look forward to seeing uh, how they uh, turn out for you and, um, you know, have fun with it. Um, and if you have any questions, don't hesitate to pop me a note during the next week and I'll uh, do what I can to help you out. So thanks again and we'll, uh, we'll talk to you soon. Bye for now.